Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to another one here on the channel. In this week's video, we're going to be talking about why a brushless DC motor has three wires exiting the can of the motor. Now, when this question was brought to me and asked of me, the person actually gave their own answer. And that answer consisted of, is it because one of the wires, for example, C1 is positive, the second wire is negative, and the last or third wire is a signal wire? Well, this is interesting because as I thought about this, this is actually kind of correct and also not so correct. And that's what I want to dive into and understand today. So let's go and take a look at the left side of the board. In order to understand how the three wires and why we need three wires, we have to understand what's going on inside of that motor. And this is what this is representing right here. First thing that we gotta talk about is the windings of the motor. This is an in-runner motor. Our windings are positioned on the can, right on the inside of the can, so the outermost part of the motor. So let's take a look at B1 for example. We have a winding that is ran here and it is connected to B2 which is exactly on the opposite side of the motor. Same thing for A1. It is going to be connected to A2 on the opposite side of the motor and same thing with C1 connected to C2 here. Now if you notice all of the twos, A1, A2 and B2 are connected by this wire that forms a neutral point within this motor. And that is quite important. It's important because all motors will have to have the coils terminated in some configuration. This is known as our Y configuration. There is a second method and that is known as the delta configuration, the delta wind. If you wanna know more about the Y or delta wind, I will leave a link in the description below so you can check that video out and get more details as to the differences to these types of windings. Now let's take a look and understand about what is happening with our magnet. So we have a two pole motor here. How do we know? Because the magnet within our motor is a north pole and a south pole. Biggest core function of the magnets is to provide us with some means to actually get this motor to rotate. As we know, Opposite poles attract and like poles repel. So a north and south pole is going to be attracted to each other. A north and north pole is going to repel. This is very key because this is exactly how we get motion out of this motor. So now let's talk about how we actually can get that motion by powering certain coils. Let's keep it very simple and start off with powering B1. We're gonna power B1 to a degree that gives us a south pole on this coil. Now because it's a south pole and our rotor here has a north pole, opposites attract so we know that we're gonna get this magnet to line up exactly with that coil. Now in order for that to continue, we then have to energize C1 so that we get a south pole here on C1 and then that would end up rotating yet again to align itself with the south pole created from our coil here at C1. This would be a very simplistic form here for our brushless motor. Motors don't actually operate like this because if we only operated one coil at a time, the motor would be quite inefficient. So what's actually happening is we're gonna provide power to two separate wires here on our motor and that is going to give us some sort of reaction. Let's take a look at exactly what's happening when we do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have B1 be our negative which can also be represented as our ground, our reference point. C1 is going to become our positive value and this is let's say a three cell lithium polymer battery here at 11 volts. So the C1 here 11 volts that is going to be representing our positive and the B1 being our zero volt reference point, this is going to be our negative terminal. So very interesting how this is what's already starting to shape up and we'll get to A1 and what A1 is doing very shortly here. So when we talk about all of this that's happening, we have 11 volts going into C1, coming out of C2, and then going through to our neutral point, entering B2, and then exiting B1 at our reference zero volt. Now, we're going to get a bunch of poles forming at each one of these coils. We get that south pole that we were talking about at B1. We're going to get a north pole here at C2. Now we have another force acting on our rotor. We already know that the south and north are going to attract each other and align themselves there. But what's also going to be happening to this magnet is the coil 
that is forming a north pole here at C2 is going to repel that, forcing it to also move in that direction. Very important because now we have two coils that is going to influence the motion of our rotor. Same exact thing is happening here on the bottom where we have the south pole of our magnet being repelled against C1 because we have the same pole here and it's being attracted to B2 which has a north pole there as well. Now this sort of relationship is going to continue and it's a little even more complex as it starts to move in this direction because once we have the North Pole aligned with the South Pole, this is still okay where we have C1 as a South Pole, we want it to attract to C1. So we're gonna to continue to operate and have power applied at C1. However, we don't need power at B1 any longer so we can actually get rid of that negative and actually move it to A1 so that we produce a pole here. Our new North Pole is going to be existing here which is going to repel that and allow it to rotate to the next point aligning itself with our C1. So this continues to go in that direction. Now what I want to talk about before we get to what's happening at A1, I'm going to go and flip things on us so that it looks a little bit different. I'm going to change the North Pole out for a South Pole here and a North Pole here. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying that the motor made a full 180 degrees. Let's take a look at that. All right, so I ended up switching up our magnets so that we have the South Pole on the top because we're essentially saying that the motor made a full 180 degrees and the South Pole is now located at the very top of our diagram. I've already gone in and changed the north and south. Those have to flip in order for this to work. And that's very key to understanding exactly what happens when it comes to our motor and how it's working. So the north pole is going to attract our south pole just like we said before, but we only get a north pole here and the south pole and everything opposite on the other areas here if we do one thing. And that is, if we go and take our 11 volts, we change that so that we have a ground position here and we change the ground on the top so that this represents 11 volts. So now that we have a 11 volts at B1 and at C1, this is our ground. This is going to give us that North Pole at B1, flipping the orientation of the magnet. Now that we have 11 volts here, this makes sense to have that North Pole switched from the South Pole that we had just before. Now that rotor is going to be attracted to the North Pole and repelled from the South Pole at C2. Same idea happening on the bottom side where it's gonna get attracted to the South Pole at B2 and it's going to be repelled from C1 and make its way over to B2 here. Very interesting because now if we look at B1, we get the positive and at C1, we're at negative. So that does not get referenced here by our motor. B1 being minus is not true any longer because it's positive. This is the key reason as to why I said this is not necessarily true. So something changed where we're getting different values here. So now let's talk about what we have not yet spoken about and that is what is the importance and relevance of A1. This is super important, especially for a sensorless motor. A sensorless motor has no idea the relative position of the rotor relative to where all the coils are existing. And it's the job of the speed control to figure it out. The speed control has to figure out the position of where that rotor is in relation to all the coils that surround it for the speed control to remain synchronized with the motor. And it does it by reading the voltage at A1. How does it read the voltage at A1? Or how is the voltage actually produced at A1? Well, as that rotor makes its way past A1, it's gonna induce a voltage into the coils of A1 as well as even A2 because we have the North Pole, don't forget, on the other side of this motor. And as it does that, voltage is produced and the speed control is then responsible for reading that voltage, the timing of when that voltage was produced in order to understand the relative motion of the motor. And as the motor rotates, we're gonna get other coils that are powered, so not just B1 and C1, it might change to A1 and another value here of C1. Then if that's the case, B1 is going to become that reference point to understand where that rotor exists. That's gonna be our new signal. So the idea that we have a positive, a negative, and a signal is actually kind of true. However, this relationship is constantly changing and it's constantly changing multiple times per second. 
To summarize, I've represented the phases here and how they would be powered. And then the last wire, that third wire, is going to be represented as our signal wire to provide the back EMF voltage to the speed control so that the speed control can understand the position of that rotor relative to all the coils that need to be powered with this power. And as we have noted, each one of these wires are going to be receiving power, but only two of the three at a particular moment. This is very key in how and why we need to have three wires for a brushless DC motor. Well guys, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight as to how and why we need those three wires. Hope you enjoyed the video. As always, like the video if you do. Don't forget to hit that sub button so that I can see you in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching. See you in the next one.